<laughs> Be merry. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to a YouTube video behind the scenes of the filming of episode 15 of To Boldly Watch. <gasps> Too short a season. <laughs> I just started recording audio. I will record audio. Oh, my God, audio me too. Well. What a coincidence. I'm going to be more reclined this time. Ooh, we're casual. Yeah. yeah, let's relax it up. Relax it up with our, what is it, personal relaxation light. <laughs> That's, can't wait to get one of those. Yeah. Um, you guys ready to do snap? Love snapping. On the count of three. One, two, three. Wonderful. <clears throat> two times Wonder in a row. If at the end you'll be able to sort of mash up a montage of us just snapping a bunch. <gasps> I'm not sure I'm the gonna Adams keep that. The Adams family. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll start saving every snap <laughs> sound in our folder. Or lack of snap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Becca and Xander, I'd like to create an audio time capsule right now. Something mm. that we can preserve for our future selves, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, let's say, what's today? F May 13th, 2020. Yeah. Or let's, we'll say this. So the year is 2020. Let's, uh, let's have this audio capsule be opened uh, in 2070, 50 years from now. And what it will be is I want to know what you think your old person voice sounds like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I think as an actor, it's very difficult to do an old person voice when you are younger. And it's hard to kind of define what it is, much less your own voice. Mm. So I want revenge. <laughs> well, the thing is, I feel like if it's coming from like a character or something, it's or, or like a, a cartoon, it's a little easier. Mm -hmm. But when you try to do it out of your own mouth, it, there's something that's a little incongruous. Well, Give uh, me the hostages. <laughs> I will take this negotiation. So you both have like a, a diminished lung capacity, it sounds like. Oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely. From years of hardship. From years of podcasting. Now, do you think the future you from 50 years from now will be offended at the choice that past you has made? Well, I'm Absolutely. either going to sound better or worse than this. So I'm either right or complimentary. <laughs> Great point. Well, this is too short uh, a season. What's yours? Oh, oh yeah, I should actually do yeah. mine, which I think will just be a little bit softer, just, just like with this. more of a jowl. Yeah, you, you can hear my cheeks are fatter and heavier. Mm. They, well, they sag. Not full droopy dog. Just no, little. no, no. But I don't think I'll like get a jowler talk like Ooh. that. <laughs> well, that's Ooh. got an accent all of a sudden. Yeah, you just completely <laughs> Maybe changed I moved your south. accent. <laughs> yeah. When I'm older, I'll be a little bit. <laughs> I'm old now, and this is how I am. Uh, this is too short a season. When an elderly Starfleet Admiral hides a deadly secret, he hide, he leads the Enterprise D into a hostage rescue mission. Mm -hmm. Didn't trust this Admiral from the get-go. First of all, terrifying old man makeup. Absolutely yeah. horrifying. Yeah. I this mean, is before no Benjamin offense, Button. they did their best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to do old people makeup. And this one, I think, was not also just not done well on top of it as, as well. He looked like a glazed donut at some point. Yeah, well, this is the thing is that there was such a missed opportunity here with the makeup that it could have been an alien. If they had made it an alien mm. that was old, we wouldn't have known the difference. You know what I mean? Like, mm. Oh, that's what the old aliens look like. But they wanted to get that sort of we, the relation of being human to show old man becomes young man. <laughs> and they wanted to get back to sexy young man. Right. But I mean, the acting was like a Jim Henson puppet anyway, so you might as well make it look like it. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was a Jim Henson puppet for it half the episode. Very Yoda-esque. <laughs> so I want to I wanna talk about this Karnas, the governor of the Lardenfoal or something. Wow. <laughs> I'm impressed. That... <laughs> yeah, I wrote general it. syllables. It is definitely, I don't think the word lard is in there, but anyway, well uh, <laughs> this guy was so sketched from the beginning, and I'm really yeah. surprised Deanna Troy was not onto it because she said it's kind of truthful, but kind of not. Uh, <laughs> this Carnus guy, so sketchy, was like, uh, "There's a terrorist with hostages, and he'll only talk to this one admiral." And it's like, mm, feels like you're saying this. Yeah, this plot structure was real loose. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, importantly, there wasn't a lot of showing in this episode. There was a mm. whole lot of telling. Like, yeah. I actually had to rewind in the teaser, which is the first five minutes of it, to make sure I understood what was going on because there's so many people explaining the situation. Mm. And the situation is all about this past event and how it relates to now that I was like almost taking notes on exactly what was happening. Right. Um, it seems like most of these scenes, there was so much uh, dialogue and information overload that we kind of forgot to, I don't know, have fun. And play right? No. Also, there was a significant lack of like the regular cast. Like this was just basically Picard, Crusher, um, and the the guest stars. Yeah, when the away team was getting onto the transporter pad, I was like, oh yeah, Yar's in this episode. Right. <laughs> I forgot about you guys. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah, well, we meet, we meet the wife of Admiral Mark Jameson, Anne, mm-hmm. uh, who is, like, way younger than him at the beginning of the episode. And uh, right? as, as we learn, the dirty secret is he Benjamin Buttons, if that wasn't clear. <laughs> well, so he's uh, supposed to be 85, but he looks to be about 120. Like, yeah. Right? That's what I he's wrote. He's super old. Like, I have, a, I have a 90-year-old grandma, and she looks much better than he does. <laughs> Not only is he supposed to be 85, but he's an admiral in Starfleet. And the assumption is he was getting, like, the best health care ever, but uh, also that he had Iverson's disease. So it could be that that's what... Oh, yeah, know. right. Iverson's disease. That's yeah. true. Good point. We don't yeah, exactly I was going to bring up... Uh, it's, it's kind of equivalent to MS, I'd say, but it's a de- degenerative disease that is irreversible. Uh, according to the lore given in this episode and right. maintained later on if you check out the memory alpha page on it um and and really bl- blows crusher away when he starts to one get up out of his hover chair support chair the they very got a fancy name for it yeah it looks like uh, like the uh, saturns of the 90s like that that interior of a car with that wood oh, yeah. paneling and like <laughs> so totally. according you gotta to get the vacuum between the edges of, of the chair <laughs> yeah. in there so, so according weird. to trek the unauthorized behind the scenes story of uh tng uh admiral jameson's state-of-the-art 24th century wheelchair was not uh an easy thing to deal with for the prop department it cost them oh. ten thousand dollars and it what? didn't even move Whoa. well for um, that one- so so, prop? Well, you'll notice in a lot of the scenes, he's very stationary. And I think right. they had problems moving it around. There was oh, only no. like two scenes where it actually moves. And there's a couple scenes where that front compartment opens up. But for the most part, the camera moves around it and it stays stationary. You know. I kind of thought when we first see him on the transporter, it will made me realize that that transport room is not accessible. Because uh, oh, how no. does he get off of the transport platform <laughs> right. in that thing? I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's about to hover. No, nope, we just nope. got out of the scene. No. <laughs> That's true. Uh, he did marry a much younger woman, though. Anne right. is definitely several genera- like several decades younger than he is, uh, but not for long. I feel most sorry for Anne in this mm-hmm. episode. And I- For so- marrying such a D-wad. <laughs> Well, as we were discussing, like, there's so much dialogue and so much talking in this episode. We definitely needed a B-plot, and we didn't get one. And I think mm-hmm. a great B-plot would have been from Anne's perspective. Yeah. I want to know what it's like to, like, she finally has her husband back at home after he spent his whole career out in space without her. And now they can't have this retirement together because he's out back out doing it again. And, like, she knows that he's going to die, and it's only happening more rapidly, and she, he's been hiding a secret from her. Like, right. I would love to see that dynamic and her yeah, And he took her dose. Like, he just straight Right? Up, I wanted like, to I talk about that. I got one for that. you, too, but... <laughs> but I took it all yeah. at once. I took both of our doses in their entirety because I had the opportunity to negotiate on a ship again. Man. And uh, Picard gives up all of his power to this senior mission officer, which I kept thinking Picard really needs to call into Starfleet and say, yo, uh, you sent me this admiral. He's legit crazy. I'm going to have to um, not listen to him. <laughs> well, here's Yet the that thing. never happens. Yeah. And, and, and that, in a way, that can't happen. Because if Picard starts questioning an admiral's orders, that means there's disorder on the whole ship. Because then everyone's questioning Picard's orders. And who do they listen to? The admiral? which is technically higher rank or their own captain so it just create would create a bunch of confusion but you make great points like i mean crusher should have retirement been the one. is a thing in most industries uh especially the military <laughs> like yeah re- you have to retire after a certain point and at that point um a medical officer might be able right. to deem you incapable 
Was he exactly. pulled out of retirement or was he still active when they got him? Because they weren't even sure like he was around, right? Yeah. I think he was pulled out. Okay. I think so too. You bring up a good point, Becca. I think we should keep an eye on this because as I recall from my childhood, there's other admirals that get into some fishy stuff aboard the Enterprise and we'll see if they get uh, yanked down or like their orders belayed. In fact, Picard in the transporter room was like saying, you know what, Admiral, you can't go. And the Admiral turned around and says, you know what, I'm in charge of this mission. Right. And Picard says, the Admiral's correct. Right. He has that right. Yeah. And as captain of the ship, and he pauses, and I'm like, ah, this is where it's going to come. As captain of the ship, I'm in charge of where it goes, so I'm not going to allow you. But he makes the choice of, I'm going to accompany him. Right. <laughs> No, and you're just, well, you're he has to protect him. his crew. <laughs> yeah. But and well, I wouldn't Riker be pissed about this? Because his whole purpose yes. is to never let Captain go on. Yes. Now he's letting the Captain and the Admiral go down. And then Picard gets on the transporter and just shouts, Riker, you're in command of the Enterprise, energize. And I was like, that's how you leave a room. <laughs> See, Riker I was, doesn't even have the room to, to argue at all. I was wondering <laughs> if that was shot on a different day and they forgot the tone of the previous shot because <laughs> it was so casual the way Picard said it when he walked up. And then the next shot is like, Riker, you have command of the Enterprise, energize. <laughs> right. Well, you got to talk through, to be heard all through the fuzzy snow of the transport. Right. Point. But I also saw it as like, aha, I, I caught you at your own game, Admiral. I can come <laughs> with you. And it's like, that wasn't as much of an aha as you thought it was, but whatever. So I guess the A and the B plot, the B plot is sort of, you could convolute it as the backstory, which is not a very right. strong B plot. And the backstory is that Carnes and Mark Jameson have this whole history. 45 years ago, there was a hostage negotiation and Mark Jameson, it comes out, uh, instead of negotiating, he just gave the terrorist whatever he wanted, which was a bunch of weapons, solved this by also giving weapons to the other side, therefore sparking a civil war. Now, right. Karnas is a respected character um, amongst Federation actors, but Karnas is the leader of one faction of this civil war, is a terrorist himself. So I guess he was telling the truth when at the beginning he says the terrorist is demanding this because he's the terrorist, which we should have, you know, had some notes on this guy and known he's not trustworthy. I think the propaganda that, like, the Admiral had spread after the negotiation went through is that this guy's a capable leader. Right. Because he, we negotiated with him successfully. But secretly he gave him guns as well, and so he tried to get away with it. And a big plot point for that, too, is that he mentions the previous two mediators were killed because they didn't give them what they wanted. Right. So this guy's coming into this job of, like, the first mediator gone down, said, no, we can't do that. You're dead. They sent a second one. They're like, we can't do that. You're dead. The third one they sent down, like, maybe we can give you some guns. <laughs> <laughs> maybe don't kill me. Uh, but we'll, but he did it in secret and then secretly gave the other side guns as well because he figured uh, I'm not violating the prime directive of advancing their technology on one side or the other if I give them all the advanced technology. Yeah, that's not how that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it kind of makes me not care about this plot because I hate Mark Jameson yeah. so, on many levels. He's just the absolute worst. It, I wonder if he's supposed to be likable to like the the man's man that watches Star Trek. That's I don't know. I don't. Th I don't Gross. think he is. Like he's not. I mean, here's my question: What fixes this episode? Because the idea of the episode's kind of cool. The whole right. age reversal, the idea of going back to fulfill your duty to right a wrong from the past. I'm kind of on board with all that. But the way they presented it was so boring because they talked so much about it mm -hmm. instead of showing us anything. So what fixes this? Do we do we like learn to sympathize with the hostage and see? The <laughs> <laughs> do we like see hostages and like learn their situation and maybe sympathize with them and their situation i still think Anne is a good place to go to mm. in terms of her relationship i don't know what's the solution yeah we did never see the hostages who we yeah. really kind of sacrificed when we just decide to go teleport down and wander amongst the tunnels yeah, there's yeah. a convenient time bomb that like we had in previous episodes of like, we have to get to Romulan space or we have to do this. It's like, well, we have to rescue these hostages. They're going to be executed in so many minutes if we don't hand Jameson over. And then Jameson becomes the time bomb of like, if we yeah. don't do this now, he's going to die. It'll never get resolved because they won't believe that he's not, you know, dead. <laughs> so Hon Honestly, uh, I think what would have saved this episode for me is if, first of all, no offense, I'm going to recast this actor. And mm -hmm. I want Anne to also take the, the, um, the Iverson, you know, the DNA changing drink that he found mm -hmm. on Cenobus 2. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, this fountain <laughs> of youth, I want them both to take it. And I want it to be about their love. And he's doing this to prove that he can do it. And, uh, and that we're actually surprised with the reveal that he sparked a civil war because we like him. That would have been better, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's an act. That feels like a, not necessarily the actor's fault too much. Like the right. writing didn't give him much to. It gave him so much talking about what had happened instead of living in it a little bit. Uh, I, I thought I liked his sweaty monologue at the end. Uh, <laughs> I, as, a, as an actor, I was like appreciating that, especially because he didn't it, have to. He wasn't burdened by all that makeup too, and he can actually yeah. show his intensity a little bit. It was a hard role to have. Like there was a lot yeah. of stuff that you kind of had to convey um but but it wasn't done in the best way but but i'm I did... gonna be harsh and i'm yeah. gonna say that it is the actor's fault this episode is bad he was given an entire episode and right. honestly my opinion is even if you're playing a, a character that does things that are unlikable you as an actor need to find a way to make us care by mm -hmm. being likable the best villains are the ones that we care for and see yep. their point of view. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't think he played this well. I think he played it as it was written on the page, which there, if you play it as a likable person that does all these unlikable things, then we're on board. Right, and I think there was potential there with the, the formula, but they just went in the direction of this formula made this person a monster, and so we're just gonna ramp that up. And, and it was the wrong kind of way to go about it. We didn't even really see any of that transformation. We just mm -hmm. see it in different scenes where the, his makeup changes. Like we didn't right. actually see that change in personality as well. Speaking of makeup changing and his wrinkly, uh, bulbous, like almost, pulsating skin uh, turns into this beautiful baby skin. Man right. has great skin. And yet the scar on his wrist that is the blood bond he yeah. made with the guy he made a, a terrorist deal negotiation with so that they, they would remember that they're blood brothers, uh, that scar stays. I don't know. I think that maybe he hadn't gone, if it, he had only gone like 44 years, so it looked like a fresh scar and it was like just oh, when it just happened, maybe. I see. So it's that was a perplexing thing for me is why it's... didn't this guy recognize him from the past? Like I get right? that he Whoa! didn't believe he was young, but they knew him from that time. I know, I know. Or maybe accuse him of being the son or grandson. He kind of yeah, did. Or a fabrication or whatever. Yeah, he kind of yeah. loosely did. He kept telling Picard it was a charade or whatever, but like, you, you, visually you know who this guy is this right. is how you know him it was garbage it's just all garbage with big <laughs> plot holes that don't make any sense hey look <laughs> everything that the show gained with the previous episode of one one zero zero one zero zero one they may they this one this one took the back burner uh, but, and I think it's interesting, though, that if you take a look at that, um, the last one was a very ensemble heavy show where we got to see a lot of different aspects of the crew. This one, we, we got to see Picard and Crusher to an extent, but really was focused on these other guest uh, actors who, again, I think they were giving some space to um, people that were coming in from old Hollywood. Maybe it was some favors that were owed or something like that. Because I know that the actress that played Anne, I looked a little bit into it. Uh, she was actually like a blacklisted artist uh, or actress in the 40s and 50s and then came back in the 70s for like one role and then this role. Um, and so I Really? Think it was that far apart? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, just just as a reference point, um, Marsha Hunt is her right. name, and yeah. she was. I didn't do too much research, so I wanted to preface with that. But I'm really just skimming Wikipedia right now. But I'll give us a quick sidebar. Was it sidebar. like McCarthyism? It, it was uh, the House on American Activities Committee, which was oh, McCarthy's snap. committee. Her and her husband, uh, right. a screenwriter named Robert Presnell Jr., they both. Um, they were both part of an anti the House on American Activities Committee committee. <laughs> I right. think it was called the Committee for the First Amendment. Yes, that's what mm. it was. And it was something with the Screen Actors Guild too, right? Oh yes, and so a bunch of actors uh, and her, they all went and protested in Washington, including John Houston, Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, Danny Kaye. Oh wow! Um, so she was among the screenwriter number... Dalton Trumbo, being the one that Brian Cranston portrays in the movie Trumbo, which yeah, is how Trumbo. I know about this whole era. It was really sad and really. Um, informational movie well, she, she was another victim of that and both mm -hmm. her and a, a number of others were uh were blacklisted for many years uh her career did pick up later again when all of that kind of got washed away in the early 60s or late 50s but, but uh, before that didn't she she made like 21 movies or something yes. like that wow she was in a ton of stuff in the 40s yeah. can you imagine your career just right? being shut down by literally you saying that uh authoritarianism is wrong and you get you'll never work in this town again and they mean it because you can be blacklisted and, and not work, you know? Crazy. Yeah. Wild. 
But well, anyway, I she loved, was great. Yeah. I liked <laughs> I liked the actress, and I loved yeah. I loved her character and her performance. Like I definitely wanted more of her. I was sad we ignored her presence yeah. for the final scene when her mm-hmm. husband is dying. They beam her down to the planet to be and there, just... and she has like two lines. And I kind of want to see her watch as definitely as Karnas points a weapon at her husband too. Mm-hmm. I was like, Where, where's Anne's reaction? Yeah, uh, I definitely want to see that. And we kind of we get we get a sweet moment of them during his his literal last seconds of life, but. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to see her go for it. Yeah, and we get, we, I think we have the scene with Anne and Crusher and Troy, I think. And it's the three of them talking. And I wanted a conversation with them to talk about her and her feelings. But the whole thing was about Jameson and how that's going to affect yeah. her. And I'm like... I- I'm, I'm sorry, it doesn't pass the Bechtel test? No, not that literally. I said that. I was like, uh, okay, this is a Bechtel test opportunity, but they're only talking about him, right? And the that's all the time. conversation is, yeah. It was I disappointing. Th- again, that's a symptom of this damn script, which just focuses on this one dude and this conflict for 50 minutes. Yeah. Like, <laughs> let, we have to get something else going on in here. Right, right. Um, that being said, there were some really good lines. I love the line, now that smells like Jameson. <laughs> Yeah. When Karnas is referencing their uh, little mission down under the sewers where they were oh fighting like a group of welders. Like, what were those masks? Who knows? Uh, oh, you mean their tie-dye uniform? We talk the about resistance? Tie-dye here? I don't the know. aqua camouflage? Yeah, it's yeah. Team Aqua and Team Magma. That's and when they, when they beam down to these tunnels, he's like, okay, perfect. We're in the secret tunnels now. Speaking yeah. at full volume. Do you know how to sneak, dude? Right, Jeez. and we must go this way. It beams through a wall, or like data phase, is like, through a wall. hey, uh, I have schematics of this whole thing, and yeah. we're going the wrong way. We're just gonna follow the senile old man that's in a young man's bodysuit. He's okay. the he's the NPC in every RPG game that clearly is going to make a huge mistake that you have to clean up later in the level because they're being too loud or too. Or- it's the DM surrogate that's like, come on, I put all this plot together, just blow a hole through the wall and get to the bad guy. <laughs> <sighs> Uh, luckily, we can just beam out of it as soon as he ha- starts having his like heart attack. I'm about to turn into an even younger man right. at this but point. I thought he we might see him as like an infant a in a baby cradle. Yeah, I thought that, that would have been, been really I would, fun. I did ask, uh, I did write down that is this going to be a Benjamin Button situation? Right. Uh, and I actually, in the original draft, uh, he was going to revert down to the age of 14. Oh. Um, then Will Wheaton was like, not on my ship. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then people were like, it's going to be real awkward when this much, much older woman has to have like a very emotional, yeah. romantic death scene with it him. It could have been interesting, but yeah. I thought it was a sweet Some attempt. Some people are into it. I kind of liked the line, but I also like gray hair. So I didn't they, like yeah, the, the gold. fact that he only sees the gold, but yeah, it was it was close to sweet. They tried. I was like, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, that was an episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that this really um, solidifies what they need to focus on and they find going in the future in that it is an ensemble show. We want to see multiple aspects of ship life. We don't want to just focus on the captain or just these guest stars. And I think that they kind of take the notes. Because the old Star Trek was kind of like that. It was Kirk and Spock, basically, would go on these adventures, and then every once in a while they would come back or take some crew with them. Uh, and they're, they're showing that it's, it doesn't really work that way with, you know, with this they, crew. They took so much time to talk about events that we don't see and people yeah. that we don't see. We talk about Karnas for, like, 30 minutes, and we, he's only in one scene. I mean, he, he's in those view screens a couple yeah. times, but, like... He's, he's hardly in the whole thing. Right. I mean, I wonder if they could have done a flashback and lived in those scenes and then we see the negotiation throughout. We see different flashbacks and then we learn what eventually happens towards the end instead of him constantly having a poorly lit conversation in the observation lounge and confessing what had <laughs> happened knows? previously. What's my makeup going to look like now? I'll come through the shadows. I'm younger. <laughs> <laughs> Every time it's Every so time. obvious we're going to see a makeup change. Oh, bum, bum, man. Bum. But the shadows really sell it. It's hey, that fog of war. <laughs> do you guys remember those tiny little TV screens? I used to bring them to the baseball game when I was like five in yeah. 1994. They were like little boxes of like a TV set. Why well, would you we bring got them one so you of could those hear... so you could replay pictures. So I could do something else. Uh, so Slide you could show. replay pictures. Look, he yep. was younger. It's all <gasps> happening on the ship. Well, I believe you now. 
Now yeah. that I've seen these images. <laughs> Undoctorable. Yeah. You know, Picard put together a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> to prove. Of three pictures. <laughs> see? Now see? see? Now see. Whoa. <laughs> and I they know. They could have made that screen any size they wanted because yeah. they put it in in post. They had that capability. And yet, like, they couldn't think outside this tiny, tiny TV box. Also, I almost guarantee in this era, computers had the technology to morph between one image to another. I know because I was doing it as a little kid. I had this test program called Morph, and you would just plug in some pictures, and you would morph one into the other. Whoa. If I was doing that, I guarantee the special effects budget could have handled the transition. <laughs> <laughs> These are just cut away. Would Karnas have been like, hey, that's a morph. We have, we have that technology too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. We read animorphs. Yes. Um, yep. this, uh, this episode also produced uh, an, a word that I had never heard before, and I will now try and get it into my vocabulary, which is pharmacopoeia. Oh, yeah. And you saw so Crusher be so proud when she like just slipped that in. She's yeah. like, it's not in our pharmacopoeia. <laughs> <laughs> the slightly mm-hmm. drug from um, uh, which for those of you who don't know it's a book especially an official publication containing a list of medicinal drugs with their effects and directions for their use mm-hmm. any chance to check out gates mcfadden mm-hmm. and her sassy shorter haircut she's got that bob <laughs> too she's doing the bob she's working the bob but we also get to see a little bit i think I think in this one of of crusher having a life outside of the enterprise of um you know she's she ha- is a doctor and she's interested in these things and in performing these tests and these studies and even trying to find a, a finding this cure potentially for this disease but then finding out about the fountain of youth sort of drug and i think that was the moral of the the real moral of the story they were trying to say like Fountain of youth, don't do it. You get old. That was really shoehorned in in the last three lines. Really it's like, was. Well, don't pursue youth. It's a <laughs> reckless venture or something like yeah. that. It's like, okay, yeah. Age is, is and that... wisdom have their graces too. Oh, yeah. there it is. Yeah. Well said. Uh, yeah, I think we all agree this episode was, a, was uh, well, I don't think we all agree. I actually like the idea of this episode. I don't like its execution. Do you guys right. actually like the idea of this episode or don't care? It's well, absolute I... trash. <laughs> It is trashy. uh, One thing that did surprise me, though, on this walk or watch through, I fully expected like sort of have it on in the background and sort of check out, maybe make some jokes in my notes. But I ended up like fully paying attention to it, and I was like, because you have to, you You have have to to listen to every word, or else you miss the whole point because they keep telling you things in event history. That's true. I didn't want to like miss something that was glossed over yes. in yeah. a conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had to rewind several times because uh, someone w- in the room would say something and I was like, hold on, they just gave so much information. Yeah. I did the same thing. Now uh, imagine that playing live on your TV set and having commercials uh, in between to confuse you even more. Yeah, good <laughs> point. Hey, I can't wait for episode 16. Oh? <laughs> I don't know what it is. Jake, what is it? Did you just prompt me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you so want to end this episode because you disliked this one? <laughs> I mean, I could talk about 1101001 one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, right? one some more if you like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah let's, let's make the end of this episode about a previous episode. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we forgot to talk about how Dr. Crusher last episode went to see her favorite doctor that's talking true. that's what i thought Dr. you were referring to that's about like her life outside kind of, of the enterprise i kind yeah, of mixed it up in professor my head professor terence epstein yeah exactly <laughs> mm-hmm. who uh, actually cybernetics meeting regeneration so you know what it kind it of would have been better a this bit of a precursor uh about regeneration in a way it which is. we know mm. she's very knowledgeable about because she just went to a seminar right well, maybe maybe one of the writers was trying to like thread those needles and actually put that together a little bit, but they maybe. never really got the 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 page amount because they had to spend so much time with Mark Jameson's bullshit. <laughs> well, we'll see if they thread anything into next episode. <laughs> What's it about, Jake? <laughs> Are you ready to go to the kids' deck? <laughs> Did you just prompt me? I think so. I <laughs> <Let's> do. <laughs> Uh, when the Bow Breaks is our ne- next episode. Wesley Crusher must protect a group of kidnapped Enterprise children while Captain Picard fights for their release. 
we're going to see what's going on in the uh, after school Babysitter? program. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't this I like a Home Alone type Wesley. episode? I think so. Don't yeah. they get up to some antics? Oh, there's, I, there's scamps, all of them. Are there marbles <laughs> on the floor and iron swinging from ropes? It's Who this knows? episode or another one. I remember definitely some kids climbing through the vent shafts. What are those oh, called? The Jeffrey's tubes? The Jeffrey's tubes. Yeah. yeah. I think that might be another one because that one is Picard gets younger too. <laughs> Oh, right. Oh, man. We have so much to watch. Yeah. Uh, well, let's get to it. Engage. Engage. Make it so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mark Jameson said, make it so. And I was like, no, you, you don't get to it. say that. He also <laughs> called Riker number one. That's right. Picard's thing. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, Crap I'm going to stop recording now. Engage. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Uh, uh, that was t- almost 30 minutes. Nice job. Perfect. Still rolling on video. There, don't say anything embarrassing. Uh, yeah, I peed myself. No, I said no. don't. I didn't I peed say someone specifically else. say. Peed- <laughs> <laughs> Is that less embarrassing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that's just <laughs> Wednesday. exciting. Wednesday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell us when you stop doing video and then we can start confessing things. Too short a I thought you could confess it as we're still rolling. <laughs> Save. I won't lie to you, but I will try and trick you. Wait. Oh. Okay, Goodbye. Jameson. <gasps> <gasps> Smells like Jameson to me. Yeah. 